Hi everyone, I love familiar faces <laughs> again. I'm Jennifer Sauer, Scholar Services and Electronic Resources uh, Librarian here at Forsyth Library. Welcome. And yay, it's National Library Week, so we're happy Ooh. to celebrate along with the Scholarly Environment Committee and the Office of Scholarship and Sponsored Projects to present um, this little handy dandy uh, workshop for you, the last in a series of three for tips and tricks to successfully present at a professional conference. Our presenters today are Dr. Cheryl Duffy, uh, Professor of the English Department, and Becky and Mike Goss, Distinguished Professor of Excellence in Teaching and Director of the Writing Concentration. She serves on lots of writing committees. <laughs> and Dr. Emily Bright from the Robbins College of Business and Entrepreneurship economics, finance, and accounting, so I'm sure some of you are familiar with, with Dr. Bright, and they are going to talk to you today about professional presentation, decorum, dress, appearance, those types of things. So we'll let them get started. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll start off and then Cheryl will add in uh, towards the end. So we're going to talk about tips and tricks to successfully present at a professional conference. So um, I want to just start off by providing you with an introduction and that's always something I would recommend when you're presenting as well. Let people know up front what you're about to tell them um, so they have an idea what's going to be covered and it's going to help them follow the presentation better. So we're going to discuss how to talk to your audience, tips for a successful presentation, and of course how to dress for success. So when you're getting ready to present, one of the key things is to know who your audience is. There's three main categories that your audience will generally fall into. You may have individuals who are from your exact academic discipline. They're gonna know all the ins and outs, the jargons, the acronyms that go with your discipline. At a lot of conferences, it's gonna be a little more mixed. So for instance, my academic discipline is finance, but I may go to a business conference and there's individuals in accounting or economics or management who have a general idea of my discipline, but they're not fully knowledgeable in that subject. And then the third main category would be individuals who really aren't related to your discipline at all and really won't know any of the jargon or acronyms. So it's important to know who your audience is when you're preparing your presentation, whether that be a poster or an oral presentation. So it is best when, when thinking about that to avoid um, certain things. Uh, the main one which I already mentioned was to avoid the jargon. When you present your research, what's the big picture? What are you trying to accomplish? It's better just to keep it basic so that you can appeal to all of these groups. Um, when you are doing a presentation, and this would be an example of an oral presentation, observe the time limits. So often they will give you a warning, maybe a five minute or a two minute warning, but be aware of those time limits um, and practice so that you can make sure you're hitting those correct time limits. Make sure you are presenting to who the actual audience is. If it is individuals from your specialized field, yeah, you can do the jargon. You can add some of the more specifics. But know who your audience is and make sure that's who you're presenting it to. Rehearse your presentation. That's probably key. The more you practice, the more relaxed you're going to be and the smoother it will flow. Don't fidget or have papers in hand. Um, one of the biggest things I see is, is people have it in their hand, especially big pieces of paper, and they get talking, and all you're doing is following their hands. Um, occasionally, it might be useful to have some notes, but keep them small so they're not flopping around. Uh, check out the room in advance. So I was familiar with this location, so I came over here still about 15 minutes early so I could have everything ready to go. Um, and don't improvise too much. You've rehearsed it, you've practiced it, you know what your time limits are, stick with it. And something I don't have listed here is if you're doing an oral presentation, it's always good if, I, if you have PowerPoint slides to print them off and bring a copy with you. So I have my copy over there. I have it in case technology breaks down, I can still present. Or maybe there's a backup where I could put it on a projector if I need to. So it's always good to have a backup plan as well. So when I was researching for this presentation, one thing I discovered is what's called the general attention span curve. And so figure one here illustrates your audience's attention. And as I was researching this, I found, wow, this is really true. I, I realized I do this myself and, and even students in my class, I, I see this. So you start off at the beginning of a presentation really listening. 
good attention. And then as you move in to the presentation, and this is an example of a 30 minute presentation, the attention span starts to drop. Now the good news is it does pick up at the end, especially if they hear the word conclusion. So I think it's two different reasons. First, they know it's about to end, and so they're about to get out of there. But second, people who come to presentations really want to walk away with knowledge, and they think, I'm, I'm going to really pay attention here because I want to walk away with what the key underlying points of the presentation is. So understanding what the general attention span is can really be beneficial when you're preparing your presentation. So how can you really catch the attention of the audience for a longer period of time. Maybe you don't want that big dip where you think they're not really paying attention. Since we know pretty much everyone listens at the beginning, that's key to making the initial what are you wanting to accomplish statement right at the beginning. Tell them what you're planning on doing. Reinforce it throughout the presentation. And then provide a strong conclusion. This actually shows the attention span if you use intermediate conclusions. So you break your presentation into portions and you give little conclusions along the way. That maintains their attention much longer and can lead to them remembering much more about your presentation. So reminding them, reinforcing. You'll notice I'll do that several times in my presentation. Uh, reinforcing the key points so we make sure you're walking away with the message that we were trying to accomplish. So why does an audience get distracted? There are several reasons, and some of them, unfortunately, are going to be out of your control. Inadequate sound systems can occur at a conference. Technology can go wrong or noisy conference centers. Of course, we're in the library, so I'm definitely the loudest person here. Um, but you can go to a, a conference room where sometimes they have just a flimsy screen separating you. Or if you're presenting your poster at Saccade, there are people right next to you. You can't stop that. You can't tell everyone to be quiet so you can talk. So you just have to know how to deal with it. But there are some things you can do to make sure people are listening. Make sure you provide adequate background information. This is where it's key. Don't assume everybody already knows the subject area you are discussing. Provide the background information necessary so that they understand upfront what the topic is. Practice and, and have a good solid structure to your presentation. Make sure the key points are mentioned and probably mentioned multiple times. So when you are presenting, what could you avoid? And if you notice, this is my busiest slide. I actually wanted you to see this probably is information overload here, where when you glance at it, it's hard to get what the key points are. So make sure you don't have too much information on any one slide. Jargon, acronyms, you need to avoid those unless you know that everyone in your audience knows and is from your discipline. Try not to speak too fast or too slow. Many of us speak too fast. I know that's a problem I have. I'm, I'm aware of it. It is hard to change though, but be aware of the speed of your presentation. And you can use a PowerPoint and reference it, but don't stand like this when you're referencing it and read the presentation. Not only will that make it harder for you to hear, it's just really not a, present way, a pleasant way of presenting. So how can you have a successful presentation? What are some keys to making sure that your message gets across? Try to summarize the key points in one or two sentences. To do this efficiently, you really have to know your subject area. You have to completely understand what you're presenting and what you were trying to accomplish. But to capture your audience attention, this is key. And this is key if you're doing a poster or if you're doing a 20 minute presentation or 30 minute presentation. Let them know up front what is key. Don't discuss every result. So I sometimes do an analysis and I may have 20 different variables in my regression. Nobody wants to hear about 20 different variables. So how do I select which ones? I would focus on the ones that have major significance. Or if I thought a variable was going to have major significance and it doesn't, I might emphasize that. But you in no way need to go through every variable and describe it and, des and describe how significant it is or is not. So pick and choose and focus on the major results. Um, it is important to have a strong opening 
have that strong conclusion, um, and sometimes in the introduction, provide what your conclusion is. It's kind of like your abstract of a paper. Tell them what you plan on doing, how you're going to do it, and what your findings are, so they know up front what they're going to be learning about. The conclusion is important, and as that attention span showed us, it's often very useful to say, in conclusion, that will capture your audience attention and, and make sure they walk away with your key points. Um, once you finish the conclusions, you can thank people who have helped you, people who have contributed, if you've received any funding. But I would make the last point of your presentation, what is that takeaway? What is that takeaway message they want to leave with, that one or two sentence statement that you provided in your introduction, reinforce it at the end. So they always say a picture is worth a thousand words. No, not always. It needs to be a good picture, a good figure. Um, I have seen many graphs. Um, I've seen a lot of graphics on a PowerPoint that really are not adding a lot of value. Or they've done a, a chart in Excel and they just automatically defaulted to the legend being A, B, and C. But you have to read in the text to see what A, B, and C are. So make sure you label your graph so that when someone's reading it on a screen or they're walking by your poster, they can easily see and, and understand what the point is of that <coughs> graphic. Again, try to avoid jargon on, on the charts or the graphs as well. Keep it basic and don't overcomplicate it or make it too busy. When you are talking, it is better just to communicate. Pretend like you're describing your research to a friend or a colleague. Don't make it more complicated than it needs to be. Don't try to impress people by using as much jargon as you can. That will actually turn the audience off. Keep it basic. Keep it simple. Now, most of what I spoke of um, works both for a formal oral presentation as well as a poster session, but there are some additional tips, I think, that can help you be successful when you're doing a poster presentation. Um, because it's really different. People aren't coming just to see you. They're often coming to see a lot of people, so how can you attract them? Um, how do you get their time? Uh, key would be, what's that one to two sentence statement where you can get their attention? This is called the 330-300 rule. Three seconds. What are you trying to accomplish? You know, what's the key point of this poster? Then, in about 30 seconds, 30 seconds, provide a general overview of what you accomplished. What are the key findings? And then, if people ask additional questions or want to know more, you should be able to cover your entire poster and the main findings in about five minutes. So that's kind of a general rule to keep in mind. But what's most important is that three seconds. Because if you don't capture their attention initially, uh, this, this follow through won't occur. So what are your key takeaways? So are, are you gonna be nervous during a presentation? Yes, probably so, most people are. Um, about 30 minutes before this presentation, I was practicing and I was going through it and I started to have nerves. And I present every five days a week in a classroom and I've been presenting for about 15 years first day of class for me, when I'm meeting the students for the first time, I have little nerves. How do you get over that? Practice is best. The more rehearsed you are, the better prepared you are, the more confident you will feel. It's just going to take time. So being nervous is, is perfectly fine. Practice is the key. So what I've done here is, this is actually um, a video from a Sakat event that we have here at Fort Hay State University. And I want to use it to illustrate some of the points that we've discussed here. So this is just kind of spanning across and you can see how individuals are engaging with their audience. You'll see that they're providing a lot of eye contact. Um, often they move in a little closer to the audience members as they are speaking. Um, you'll occasionally see somebody step out to try to capture their attention. You'll also see them occasionally pointing to the slide, referencing some of their key findings. Um, I'm going to turn the volume on here in just a moment, and you can actually hear some examples of individuals presenting. 
And for this semester, we've been working on a project with Dr. Gordon Carlson in the Communication Studies Department. We've been using um, 3D technology provided through the library. Um, and what we're trying to do is visualize communication concepts that can often be a little ambiguous or difficult to understand. And what we do is we're going to we put it into this three-dimensional environment and then we we'll have the ability to print out the objects that we make and they can be used in classrooms to teach the concepts. So it's just a really great way of kind of unifying an idea that can often be really complex to be able to share it with other people and make it a little bit easier to understand. What we did was sound intensity measurements of a university marching band during rehearsals. And we went and took measurements in the football field, open area practice field, and inside of a practice room. And what we got was that all of the decimals recorded were above 85 dB. And research has shown that intensity levels of 85 dBA, which decibels and then the A is for the A scale, which so is most similar to the human ear, from like his what discipline, we hear, and then he came and back to explain it so that he could appeal to all different audiences on hearing for depending on how long you're exposed to that intensity. And basically, we're just trying to raise awareness because if individuals aren't knowledgeable about how to prevent um, a hearing loss, then they are susceptible for a noise induced hearing loss with how much they practice, how, how long their practice hours are, and how high of an intensity the band is to all together. And that was we the key at, takeaway uh, right there at the end. Uh, she made sure they all the surgery way. based on the operational sex ratio, which is the amount of females or males within the population. So we found that there was a significant interaction when there were less females in, uh, in the group than there were in the control group, which they were just looking at uh, scenery and stuff like that when they were looking at more females. And so we found that they were more acceptable to cosmetic surgery when they were looking at um, pictures of other females, but more females than, than uh, more men. And so we also see that at a considerable subscale. And uh, this means that uh, when there are more females in a group that females would use uh, cosmetic surgery as a acceptable strategy to attract other mates. My project is about Shabazim and the Greenhouse Project. And a Shabazim is a universal worker, and a Greenhouse Project takes over long-term care and assisted living facilities. And with these workers, they have 6 to 12 residents that they focus on, and it has shown to increase patient satisfaction, family satisfaction, staff satisfaction, and in this sort of setting, in the Greenhouse Project, the Shabazim is more at the top of the hierarchy. Whereas in a long-term care facility, the nurse or the RN is more at the top. In this part, the Shabazim are in charge of the residents 24-7. And it has shown to decrease the amount of workers in the rest of the facility. And that means the Shabazim does meal preparation, they do laundry, housekeeping, and activities. And it has shown to decrease costs to hire people in other facilities by having the Shabazim around 24-7. It has also shown to have a 4.2 decrease in pressure ulcers and a 6.3% decrease in hospitalization rates that the residents have to go back to the hospital for some sort of illness. And it also improves the residents' uh, activities of daily living. They're able to do their own things for a longer amount of time. So you can see most of them hit on right around that 30 seconds. Um, the last presentation that we saw there, she defined what the key words were in her title initially, right at the very beginning, so that the audience knew exactly what her presentation was going to cover. So um, hopefully you picked up some general tips that might help you attract your audience. Um, again, in that example, you saw the noisy, you heard the noisy background. Again, you can't Tell everyone to be quiet while you speak, but hopefully you've picked up some tips that will help you be more successful in your speaking. I'm going to now let Cheryl uh, discuss um, some additional tips to help you be successful in your presentations. Thank you very much. Um, Leslie is passing around a... Okay, this is one of those, like, I'm going to talk about checking out the room, so I should have, I should have had the third Okay, here we go. Because that didn't look very professional, so just saying. Um, I have a handout for you, and some of these tips were, were already covered, but uh, some of them bear repeating. Some of them I'll, I'll skip. What I start with is number one, most important, really is practice. 
and I mean, look in a mirror and practice. Ideally, get some other people that you can bribe with pizza or whatever to <laughs> actually sit and listen to your spiel a little bit. Because it's one thing to be able to talk about your poster or your research, whatever, just to yourself driving your car. But it's another thing when you're actually looking at people. So practice in front of people. Maybe set up your cell phone and record yourself and play it back and listen to, hmm, how many times did I really say, um, <laughs> so the, the, the more you practice, and even for a poster presentation, you know, there's that, that little spiel that you give that sums up what your, your research is about or what your poster is about. Have that, have that in mind already so that you're not just speaking off the cuff and you have a, a practiced, polished way to talk about your poster. If you have a PowerPoint, don't just read off of your notes or your PowerPoint. That should, your poster, your PowerPoint should give additional information or key information to your audience, but it's really more about having a conversation with your audience, whether it's a more intimate conversation with a poster presentation, or if you're doing a conference presentation, you might have eight people. I've done those kinds of presentations before. You might have 50 people. You just don't know. But try to make it a little more conversational rather than I'm going to read this information to you. Uh, exude confidence. That means you smile. Please don't make it look as though it's painful for you to be there doing what you're doing. Because if you look as though you're in pain, they're going to feel your pain. You will just exude that. So maybe just fake it. If it really is painful, don't let them know. So stand tall smile, look them in the eye, speak clearly, uh, don't chew gum, don't <laughs> apologize, like, I'm sorry, I'm really kind of nervous. Don't say, I'm sorry, I'm really kind of nervous. Just move beyond it, and the nerves will pass the more you talk. Maybe if you're at that poster presentation, maybe the first people that stop and you're talking to them, that might be a little uncomfortable, but the more you do that, the easier it will be will become. And if you're doing a conference presentation, you might be a little bit nervous at first, but chances are this is something that you care about. This is something that you love and that you're proud of. And so just relax and have a conversation about it with people who are interested in it. Turn off your cell phone. Um, no, that wasn't talking to anyone specific right now. That's just, you know, number, number four on there. But yes, there's nothing more embarrassing than presenting and having your cell phone go off. I'm not speaking from experience, but from having witnessed it, I promise. Decide ahead of time what you're going to do with your hands and fidgeting or jingling your keys or your change that not options. So think of your hands as, okay, I'm an English professor, so think of your hands as punctuation marks, right? So you can enumerate your points first, second, third. You can, if you say there was a wide disparity in Ah, wide, see, you can go wide with your hands. So use your hands to emphasize the points that you're making. Try not to gesture too wildly. Try to keep, uh, keep your hands in fairly close, but don't be afraid to use your hands to gesture. If you're not comfortable gesturing, and my daughter will tell you that I really can't talk, like if you tied my hands, I, I probably couldn't talk. <laughs> so if you're not that kind of person, then maybe you're more comfortable just doing this. Clasp your hands and hold it here and have a conversation and that will keep your hands contained. I'm doing mock interviews with my writing internship students this week and one of the, the interviewees, the whole time he was, he was doing this with his hands and it was hard for me to listen to what he was saying because I was thinking, stop fidgeting. So <laughs> you might not even know you're fidgeting. I'm sure he had no idea he was fidgeting. So I, my suggestion to him was, Hold your hands in your lap and talk. Because gesturing doesn't come natural to me. No one expects you to, to know everything about your topic. I think that's something I was a little intimidated about when I was earlier in my career doing presentations. I thought, what if they ask me something I don't know? What if they bring up some topic that's related but I haven't explored that myself? No one really does expect you to know everything. And so as a, as a professor, I, I know the value of saying, that's a really good question, I'm not sure. That would be interesting to, to look into. So be, be comfortable saying you don't know and that you'll, you'll look into that further. Or say, that, well, maybe that'll be the topic of my next research project. I don't know. 
Scan the audience during your presentation. I think I might do a little too much. I'll be interested to watch, actually I'll be paranoid as heck to watch this uh, recording, but it will be interesting. I think I have a tendency to do a little too much sweeping. So maybe I'm gonna pause now and just look at key people. And you can find those smiling faces and I'm so happy you're all smiling. <laughs> but if you can find someone who is a friendly face, then focus on that person. Focus on that friendly face. If you're not comfortable looking someone in the eyes, you don't have to look them in the eyes. Right now I'm not looking anybody in their eyes. I'm looking over your head between people uh, and you don't know. So if, if it freaks you out to look somebody in the eyes, don't do it. But don't, that doesn't mean look down at the floor or look at the ceiling either. Make them think you're looking at them at least. And if they're close, uh, just look at their forehead. You know, they don't know you're not looking them in the eyes. <laughs> Speak loudly, clearly, and slowly. I'm like right where speaking fast just comes naturally to me. And if I already speak fast, then put me up in, uh, in front of a crowd where I may be just a little bit nervous or on the edge and I'm just going to race through it. So I need to sometimes just take a breath and speak slowly and clearly. And related to that, well, I just want to get to it. Number 12 says, don't fear the silent pause. Another person I was doing a mock interview with said, um, about every other sentence. And I told her, I said, you know, um, if you're um, trying to think what you're going to say next, um, you can just let there be a pause. Don't fear that pause while you gather your thoughts, what you're going to say next. It sounds more polished to have a pause than to fill all of those pauses with um or uh. And you may not know you're doing it. I can remember, yeah, I'm gonna give you a date. I remember in 1979, some people in here were born, but not very many. Uh, <laughs> but it was 1979 and I was an undergraduate and I was going to be a teacher and so they videotaped us. Yeah, you know, these big plunky video cameras with that VHS tape slammed in it. And we did this little micro-teaching demonstration, and so I, I taught this little session. I was feel pretty good about it. You know, I've never been shy in my life. And I watched it, and I was saying, um, like every other sentence. And I had no idea I had been doing that. Had I not watched, uh, which I'm sure is the reason that they videotaped us doing this teaching demonstration so that we could see what really is our presence when talking to, to a crowd. So. That's something that I still work on a little bit. Dr. Brown, I already talked about visiting the room ahead of time, and you really want to do that. I can remember one time I had all my equipment. They did; they weren't providing the projector. I had to check out a projector and bring it, and I was all ready. And there was no way the cord of my projector would reach the plug-in. I hadn't thought of bringing an extension cord. Fortunately, I had gotten to the room early and realized that I needed an extension cord and so I went to one of the conference organizers and said, can I get an extension cord in concourse room B and they got it. And, I was, it was cool. <laughs> but, and it's also good just to see where you're going to speak. I think it takes the edge off a little bit if you've got a sense of what does the room look like and I will be able to find the room when it's time and I know where my poster is ahead of time. So it's good to just kind of scope things out. You saw me at the beginning like dragging this over. That was, I really did that. It was really on purpose. You may think that that was an accident, but did that really illustrate the importance of thinking about where you're going to stand and what you're going to say ahead of time. And especially, I'm going to blame her because I was just going to stand here with this paper, right? And then she said, don't be having this paper you gave around. <laughs> I was like, okay, I'll use the lecture. Yeah, good idea, good idea. And it is, it is better. I can step away from that piece of paper and talk to you and glance down and I'm not rattling around with this piece of paper. So good advice, thank you. So you can teach old dogs new tricks. <laughs> Number 10, we already, we just talked about if you have handouts, have someone else distribute them. It was good to have Leslie Page pass those out to you so that I could <laughs> drag my lectern into place. Uh, so that, that that was one less thing I had to worry about. So let someone else handle that. And number 12, we already talked about appearance. 
and I kind of need to be up front, so I'm just going to break the rule and break the law <laughs> and step out here. So when in doubt, dress up. You saw uh, people uh, in that video, and it, it might be interesting. I don't, I don't think we'll, we'll take the time to do it, but it would be interesting to watch it again after we've talked about appearance, and you could kind of critique. It's like, okay, this was this was the most professional outfit. This. This work, and I, I think you can be maybe a little more informal in a poster presentation as an undergraduate student. But I, I say, if you're going to lean anywhere, lean, lean up, lean, lean dressed up, lean. Don't, you know, you don't have to wear a tux, but still, I, I one of my mock interview students, he showed up in a suit and tie, and it was like, yeah, white shirt, suit, tie. That's very professional. And I told him, I said, you made an excellent first impression. I think you want to be taken seriously. So so look at, at how you're dressed and say, would I be taken seriously wearing this? A jacket or a blazer is a good idea. The advantage of that too is you're never sure of the venue and if, if you show up and it's a really casual venue and you have a jacket, well then you can always take that jacket off and drape over your chair and, and be more, more casual. And a note for women at the ceiling here just because this has happened so many times I I take students to we, we go out and we teach in, in the high schools and so I say I want you to dress up well now I have to be more specific because I have to tell you that dressed up does not mean dressed up for a night on the town uh, so don't, don't show up to teach high school boys in a cocktail dress I'm just gonna say you know if it's short if it's tight if it's low cut if it's all of the above then maybe you're not going to be taken seriously, you know? Maybe you're not going to be listened to for your ideas, and that's what you want. So I would say avoid short skirts, form-fitting, look at tops, flashy jewelry. I don't know if this is too flashy or not. I don't know. <laughs> Bold makeup. The look you're going for is professional, and we're not talking about the world's oldest profession. So keep that in mind. Now, I know to men, dressed up does mean more than clean jeans and a collared shirt. So uh, darker colors, darker colors, crisp fabrics are uh, usually more formal, especially when we're talking about you know, your jacket. And since you don't have a jacket, I think it's good that you had, have this uh, dark shirt, uh, even though probably you didn't have to dress up just for us. But you know, that's a nice touch. Uh, <laughs> black slacks, dress shirt, tie is going to be dressier than khakis and a polo. And I'm sorry if those two previous uh, bullet points were sexist. They, I realized they were a little bit sexist. Sorry. Pay attention to details. Iron the slacks. Clean the fingernails. I mean, give yourself a manicure. Polish the shoes. I've had people come for interviews and they look wonderful until you see their shoes, which are all scuffed up and ratty looking. Don't do it. Speaking of shoes, you want professional and comfortable. And for women, typically, Closed-toed shoes and not uh, strappy sandals, not uh, spike heels, right? And overall, dark colors lend a little more credibility, and I think solid colors a little bit more. Like Leslie Page looks lovely today, but I don't know, a little kind of, a little flashy there, a little flashy with all that Paisley going on. I don't know. I don't know if I if I make if I go for that place Paisley. Uh, I and I. You have to understand that the, the suggestions I'm giving do lean toward conservative. You probably could get by wearing that, that easily uh, top to, to do a presentation. And I will tell you that now that I've been doing presentations for, for decades, I tend to go a little more casual. It's like, hey, take me as I am. But earlier in my career, I, it was more important. I didn't have the credibility of decades <laughs> behind me. So I can guarantee you, the first year that I taught, I wore a jacket or a blazer every single day and dress shoes, yeah, the whole, the whole bit. So with, with that being said, critique my outfit. There's one thing especially that wouldn't quite work for a professional presentation. And notice I said one thing. So I don't want to hear five things <laughs> wrong with my look today. So anybody? The shoes. The shoes. Yeah. The shoes, cute. Uh, aren't they cute? You know, and uh, but I I have an excuse. I actually 
I actually went through chemo a year ago and it just devastated my toenails and they're, they're coming back, but my, my closed-toed shoes really were, I'll show it, good. this is an excellent example, yeah, there she goes again, like don't wave your paper around and now she's like, now look at my shoes, yeah, that's right, but those, those are excellent because they're, they're flats, you don't, I can remember I used to do uh, like speech and debate and I used to do piano contest and I can remember being at piano contest in heels and, and my heels, my, my knees were like, I thought that was only on cartoons where knees did this, but my knees were like knocking. And, and if, I, if I'd had solid shoes, I, I think I could have controlled that a little more, but I was on this unsteady, uh, yeah. You don't want to wear those shoes that aren't comfortable and that are high-heeled and uh, even open-toed. And I will tell you that I was on an interview committee uh, years ago when I taught at Colby Community College, and there was someone who interviewed for a position, and I know in my mind I was prejudiced against her immediately because of her shoes. Call me shallow, call me wrong, but I thought, you know, this is an interview, this is professional, and they looked like, I would say Walmart, but it was even before Walmart. That's how old I am. So <laughs> I'm gonna say it was like Alco shoes. These are like uh, Alco uh, sandals that were clearly like light blue vinyl plastic kind of over, I'm, I'm sorry, I said, I'm, I'll probably decide you're thinking, I've got those shoes. Fine, <laughs> they're fine shoes. Don't wear them to an interview to teach at the college. Shoes I'm wearing right now. So, scan in your shoes. <laughs> She's judging us. My, <laughs> my final point, my final point is, if you're doing a, a PowerPoint, don't have your last slide be the last thing you say. Have the, have your last slide, and then turn and sum up to your audience. Have, have the last part of your presentation be you with your audience, and then open it up for questions. Okay? Any questions? How was that first? Okay. Well, I did have one last slide. There we go. Let's see if it'll go through. Whoops. Welcome no, to not. the John Heinrichs. <laughs> There. So, in conclusion, um, hopefully you got some good points from what we had to say today. They all perked up. You said yeah, I know. That's in conclusion. Um, know your audience. So know who you're speaking to. Think about that when you're preparing either the poster or the oral presentation. Prepare. Practice. And dress for success. Thank you. <laughs> talk about skirt